today's our um, uh, Thursday conference, and um, our speaker is uh, well known to most of you. She's been around the department for um, a number of years now. And um, for those who don't know, um, this talk is the first step in the PhD um, program that the uh, student does in terms of giving a symposium kind of overview of what they're interested in that will later progress into their proposal, uh, dissertation proposal defense, and then ultimately their uh, dissertation defense. So Rory Blucher, who many of you uh, know, is uh, Hale's originally from Alaska, although she's been in Portland a, a number of years, uh, did her undergraduate work at the University of Portland, and she's been a PhD student and NLM pre-doctoral trainee in our program. So I will send it to her. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, thank you so much for coming today to listen to my symposium presentation. The title of my talk is Predicting Adverse Drug Reactions from Off-Targets. So there's two key aspects to any drug. One is how well it works or its efficacy, and the other is its safety or tolerability for a patient. Today we're going to be focused on the safety arm of drugs. So when we talk about toxicity concerns, oftentimes we're talking about side effects or adverse drug reactions. We can use these terms interchangeably. Side effects can be good or they can be bad um, as far as whether they're harmful or beneficial, but when we talk about predicting and preventing adverse drug reactions, we're usually talking about the harmful ones. They range in severity, so they can be as mild as a headache or nausea or as severe as organ failure. And every year they result in tens of thousands of hospitalizations, permit disability, and death for patients, so they present a significant health care burden. They're also a major source of attrition in the drug development pipeline. So it's estimated that we lose up to 30% of our <coughs> of our lead candidates just to toxicity concerns. And you probably heard about them because they're the reason for uh, many famous aftermarket withdrawals of drugs. So a famous example is Biox, which was an NSAID that was on the market for about five or six years. And um, it was used to treat arthritis and chronic pain, but it actually came out that it was increasing risk of heart disease, of heart attacks. So it was pulled after the fact. So if we think about side effects in terms of a drug interacting with receptors, we can classify them in a couple different ways. Uh, the first would be the drug is interacting with the primary target in the primary tissue in the body. It's just that rather than having the therapeutic effect that's intended, um, either there's too much or too little. So an example of this would be dosing for anticoagulants. There's a very narrow therapeutic, therapeutic window. Um, another class of side effect would be the drug interacts with the primary target, but that target is present in a different tissue in the body, so it has an unwanted side effect. Um, an example of this is morphine, acts on receptors in our brain to have a pain-killing effect, but there are very similar receptors to these in our gut, and that can cause constipation. Uh, the third class is what the focus of the talk is going to be, and that's secondary or off-targeting. So this is when the drug interacts with receptors that are not the primary um, receptor. So a quick example is the HIV drug rescriptor also causes rashes because it interacts with an alternative receptor. Uh, lastly, you can also imagine that you can have side effects due to um, interactions between these different types of targets, but today we're going to focus on the third category. So to understand a little bit about the context of off-targeting, most of the history of drug design has been really um, steeped in this paradigm that we can design a drug to selectively bind to a target, and then that target will have some therapeutic effect. Um, this is where a lot of our attention has been in this selective design, but what we found in recent years is that the truth is, is that drugs bind to multiple targets, and these targets can have different effects. So this is the off-targeting aspect that I just discussed. This uh, phenomenon is known as polypharmacology, and we're only just starting to really recognize and try to deal with it in both drug design and um, just in giving drugs. So what do we currently do to identify off-targets? 
We don't actually look for them directly. What we do is conduct the safety screens in the drug development pipeline. So these are basically panels of targets that we know are associated with toxicity or some adverse event. And we check to see if our candidate drugs bind to any of, any of these targets. So um, a great example of this is the HERG receptor, which is a potassium channel that's been related to adverse cardiac events. And this is actually one of the only federally mandated uh, toxic targets that you have to screen your drug against. Um, but you can imagine that you can't check your potential drug against all protein targets. There's a lot in the human body. So these screens are limited by time, cost, and resources. What ends up happening is that most adverse drug reactions are identified once a drug is already on the market. And this is definitely not ideal because that means patients are already going to um, are taking the drug and going to be experiencing the reactions. So there's definitely a need for computational and predictive models to help us identify these reactions much earlier in the process. And just to give you an idea of where we are, we'd really like to use these models in the preclinical screening process. So that's after we've identified candidate compounds, but before they've actually entered into human clinical trials. Uh, so for the arc of this talk, what I'd like to do is go through some of the groups of approaches as people have tried to tackle this problem of can we predict a drug side effects or adverse reactions um, before they actually happen. And so I've grouped these approaches into a, um, a couple different subsets. And we're going to start with approaches that look at just the drug itself or compound structure approaches. And then we're going to add on kind of like another layer, um, interactions between the drug and the target. And then we're going to move up into network approaches. And lastly, I'm going to discuss kind of an alternative category, which I've just called phenotypic approaches um, for now. So approaches that consider just the structure of a drug, um, so also, I'll also call them chemical structural approaches, rely on this principle that similar structure implies similar activity. So for those of you that are familiar with QSIRs or quantitative structure activity relationships, that's basically you play this game of can we find the molecular features in a chemical compound and relate those to some activity. Oftentimes this is used for um, toxicity prediction. So that's the same principle that we're going to see in these approaches and most of them utilize this idea of a chemical fingerprint. So this fingerprint is just a vector of ones and zeros where ones indicate the presence of a particular chemical group in the compound. And the reason we do this is it's a really nice way to describe a compound and then it lets us easily compare compounds without actually having to look at drawings or these 2D descriptors. Um, so down here I've highlighted a very famous similarity metric called the Tanamoto coefficient. And Tanamoto just um, takes the number of shared chemical groups groups between compounds and divides it by the number of total groups. So one of the strongest examples of using this um, idea to predict adverse drug reactions was by Bender et al. in 2007. And this certainly wasn't the first group to do this, but they were the most large scale study. And what they wanted to do was see whether you could use chemical structure to predict ADRs across, across many drug classes and many reaction classes. So they really wanted to broaden scope to see if this relationship held true because up until this point, um, this approach had really only been used for very focused studies on drugs or particular toxicity reactions. And so what they did is they, they created two models, one where they related chemical structure to activity against targets, and another one where they created a model relating chemical structure to adverse reactions. And then they use this to create a bridge between the activity against the targets and the adverse reactions. And this did pretty well when it came to classifying um, off targets as being related to known adverse events, they had about 90 to 92% accuracy. So that works um, spurred a lot of follow-on work in the same vein. And most papers that use this chemical structural similarity approach are going to cite that paper as paving the way for them or showing that this is a good tactic to take. And so rather than go through those because they use the similar ideas, um, I wanted to highlight something interesting that has come out of uh, this work. And I think it's best shown by this group, Yero. It's very recent. 
who basically asked the question, well, what's the difference of look between looking at the 2D structural similarity and the 3D structural similarity? And they posed this example of, let's say you have two compounds that look um, very dissimilar at the 2D level, but in fact, when you look at their three-dimensional shape, they're very similar. And so this might be important because if we use 2D similarity metrics, we're going to miss it. But in fact, the 3D similarity could mean that this, these two drugs bind to the same type of target protein. And briefly, what their model did is they set it up so that they could take some query compound and compare that compound to a set of compounds that have a known effect. They did this using both 2D and 3D. And what happens is if you find that your query compound is likely to be a part of a set, then you infer that it has a shared target. Um, so you can imagine that they did this for compounds who they already knew what the off-target was and tested to see if they could recover that information. So that's a very common um, tactic in a lot of these approaches. What they found was very interesting because they showed that 2D similarity is awesome for predicting primary targets of drugs. But 3D similarity is better when it comes to predicting the off-target or the secondary effects. And their explanation really stuck with me because what they said is we're dealing with a bias in the data, especially for the 2D structure. And that's because of these Me Too drugs. So what happens in drug design is it takes a lot to get a drug from start to finish. And when one finally makes it out the pipeline, you see a lot of follow-on drugs that are designed basically to mimic that compound. Um, and then they postulated that maybe 3D similarity is better at capturing information about off-targets because 3D similarity may be capturing uh, information about uh, actual binding pocket features. So chemical structure approaches definitely make up the bulk of the approaches in trying to predict adverse drug reactions for a given drug but there's definitely some limitations. So the diversity of the data sets used, a lot of times they're very, very specific um, predictive models and it's not clear how well they generalize to broader classes or how they'll work on truly novel compounds since most of them are tested um, on drugs that are already out there. Uh, like we talked about, there's this inherent bias, especially in the, the 2D structural data for drugs because of follow-on and Me Too drugs. Um, and then, really, there's this question of whether this approach is the strongest one to take. This assumption that similar structure means similar activity doesn't always hold true. In fact, there's many examples of molecules that are very similar as far as their structure, but they have completely different effects. Um, so some people are not convinced that this is even the way to catch all the off-targets. And also, this view is limited in that it only looks at properties of the drug itself. So what happens if we go up a level and actually start looking at the drug interacting with the protein binding pocket? So these are kind of what I've classified as ligand protein interactions. And you can imagine when that drug comes into bind with the pocket, there's all different sorts of interactions that can happen. I've listed just a few, like hydrophobic interactions, um, water molecule displacement, salt bridges. And there's approaches that try to take this into account when predicting adverse reactions. And two of the main types you'll see are protein ligand interaction fingerprints. And those use the same idea as the fingerprint we talked about before, only instead of keeping track of the chemical groups, they keep track of these interactions. Um, and then something you might all be a little more familiar with is docking approaches or virtual screening. So this is commonly used in just traditional uh, drug design. And the idea is that you can take a panel of small molecules, drugs, and actually virtually, uh, virtually simulate them fitting into a protein target. And this allows you to come up with a score and say, well, this is a good match. We think this binding reaction occurs. And then you can then test it. So like I said, this is used in drug design a lot. Um, but it has now started to be picked up for possibly predicting off-target reactions because you can imagine that you could take a drug structure and you know the drug is associated with an ADR and then you can try to find places it binds using this. Um, and what's really great about this approach is that it allows you to discover novel off-targeting binding reactions. However, um, docking in particular is limited because you need that 3D protein structure and at this time we're still limited in the availability of those. So 
It really depends on your use case. And these methods um, seem to do very well, but it's hard to compare them because they're so variable in the features they take into account, how they score it, and restrictions they place on the whole problem. So uh, one example is some docking methods allow a drug to be very flexible when it comes to a binding pocket, and others give it a rigid confirmation, and then that's it. So it can be very difficult to really assess um, these methods or compare them to each other. And as oftentimes what you see is they can actually come up with different results for these panels. And while we've added more information, we're still treating the drug target interaction as though it's an isolated event. So what happens if we start to go up another level and say there's more of a system behind all of this? And so this is what I've called network approaches. And what I, the distinction I want to make here is that a lot of the network approaches are really just approaches here. They're ways of connecting information rather than using true molecular network information. So, for example, a lot of these networks are constructed using drugs as nodes, and the connections between the nodes may be these drugs are structurally similar, for instance. So it's the same principles we just talked about. You could also do this for targets and connect targets based on similarity. Or some of the networks connect, um, make connections between drug nodes if they share a target. Um, this one in the background here is an example of a drug target network, and this was done using all the FDA approved drugs and their known targets. And while this didn't actually connect to adverse reactions in particular, it was used as, um, it was basically the first example to do this for all the FDA approved drugs, and a lot of the work in predicting adverse drug reactions started from this and uses some of the stuff they came up with. But what about actual, what we think of like true systems information? So there's a lot of interaction data such as protein-protein interaction data. And I was really surprised to find that that really hasn't been used in this problem yet. So one of the only examples that I could find, um, for example, using protein-protein interaction um, is by this group, Wang et al. And a couple of years ago, they did a network, they created a network approach where they connect drugs and targets. But then they expanded their target network to include all the other proteins that a target protein interacts with. And they found that for their machine learning approaches, including this information improved their predictions. Um, but there's a couple papers that they've put out, and that basically <laughs> comprises all the work in this area that I've found so far. And then uh, one other thing I'd like to mention is there was a group that created a network of adverse drug reactions connected to the protein targets and started to expand that with protein-protein interactions, but that wasn't at all connected to the drug, which was very interesting. So it actually wasn't in this realm of pr predictive models for ADRs. So when we go up to the network level, it's really surprising to find that most of these approaches use this idea of a similarity network they don't actually incorporate molecular information. So like I said, there's very limited use of protein-protein interactions. And another thing is that there's almost no discussion of what we think of as true pathway effects. So upstream, downstream, uh, basically directing those edges between nodes. And then uh, for the last group of approaches I'll talk about is this phenotypic approaches. And I'd just like to highlight an example that uh, has tried to use gene expression profiles for this problem. So this work builds off of Connectivity Map, and Connectivity Map is a database that um, has data from human cell lines that's been treated with drugs. And one of their key ideas is that we can define a, a disease state or a condition based on this profile. And then, using that profile, we can find a match or a drug that has the opposite effect. So if you imagine that a disease state upregulates a bunch of genes, their suggestion is, well, let's find the drug that downregulates those genes so we can restore balance. So this group uh, worked off of connectivity map data. And their idea was, well, let's say drugs um, bind to the same target. That target should be affecting the same downstream gene, so we should see very similar expression profiles. And in fact, they found this was the case. So what this allowed them to do was say, well, we can look for similar expression profiles 
um, for two compounds and infer that they then share the same target. This was all a setup <laughs> for their work um, to try and associate adverse drug reactions with gene expression profiles. So what their method did, very briefly, is they took a query compound and compared it to a set of reference compounds, which we've seen before. Only now, instead of using structural similarity, they did this on the basis of the gene expression profile. And their reference compounds were all compounds that have a known associated adverse drug reaction. So they used this to basically say, for some query compound, what's, uh, what's the likelihood or what's the risk? Is it at risk for any of these adverse drug events? To wrap up, I'd like to finish with a case study that I think highlights a lot, um, a lot of the concepts we've touched on throughout the talk. And this is for torcetrapib. So this was a cholesterol ester transfer protein inhibitor. And it was designed to treat high cholesterol and prevent heart disease. And it was very, very promising um, until it reached phase three clinical trials when it was withdrawn abruptly and it was a big surprise to everyone involved because it had fatal side effects. Uh, it was causing heart attacks. And one of the reasons it was so surprising is there were two very similar compounds and or structurally similar compounds that didn't show these effects and that had also seemed promising. So uh, everyone was kind of blindsided by this. And this case study is about a group that said, well, can we interrogate uh, the off targets and trying to understand what went wrong here and why this happened. So what they did is they said, well, we know it's a CETP inhibitor and we know the primary target. So they characterized that binding site and then they basically just searched for that elsewhere in the human proteome. And then they took all of those places and said, these are potential off targets where torcetrapib may be binding. And then they further refined that by um, running the virtual screening or docking simulations on both torcetrapib and these two similar compounds to actually see how well the match was. And long story short, what they found is this idea that these compounds, though very similar at one level, actually had very different binding profiles when you looked at their off targets. So here the arrows are indicating binding to off targets shown in the yellow boxes. Red is strong, purple is not as strong, and blue is very weak. So when they actually put these off targets into a context and asked what they did, they found that uh, all the off targets on the left side are positive regulators of a system that controls blood pressure. And the one on the right is a negative regulator. So the important point here is torcetrapib binds very strongly to the positive regulators, and it basically ramps the system up. Whereas JTT705, which is one of the compounds that didn't show the negative side effects, binds to both the positive and the negative re regulators and probably is causing some sort of a balance. So they hypothesized that because torcetrapib is binding to off targets and this balance isn't holding, that's why we're seeing these uh, disastrous side effects. And another thing that's interesting from this example is that you'll note that JT T705 actually binds to more off targets. And this goes against a lot of our thinking because we tend to think of off targets as inherently bad, but it's really what they're doing in the long game. And uh, I just thought that was an interesting point. And so I think this case study really uh, illustrates the need for context of these drug target interactions. And I think it's a very successful example of why or how this information can help us really understand how that drug is eliciting these reactions. So just to go over some of the main points again, there's a lot of structural approaches when it comes to treating this problem, um, but they suffer from a lack of diversity in the drug data, especially approved drug data. There's definitely this um, inherent bias in 2D structure due to these Me Too drugs. And then there's also also this question of whether similarity um, approaches are the best way to tackle the problem, given that not all similar mo molecules have a similar effect. And there's been quite a few docking approaches which seem to do very well, but they're limited by the presence, uh, by the availability of those 3D crystal structures. And they're highly variable, so it makes it hard to compare and really quantify how well they're doing. And overall, structure is really only one piece of this puzzle, but it makes up the bulk of 
the work in tackling this problem. When we go up a level and you would, or at least I would expect to see more work in actual systems approaches, we really don't see a lot. There's a lot of network approaches, but they're using um, these similarity metrics in some way or another. And there's been very limited use of protein-protein interactions and almost no characterization of downstream effects and very limited use of gene expression profiles. And in particular, when it comes to the protein-protein interactions or downstream effects, this is interesting because it means that we're really focused on the drug binding to the off-target and that off-target having to be directly connected to the adverse drug reaction. We haven't really expanded to include more about whether that off-target starts a signaling cascade and how that could lead to the adverse reaction. Um, and so I think what all this highlights is really that we're missing the context. And what the case study, I think, highlighted so well is that's going to be absolutely crucial for understanding how these reactions um, actually take place and hopefully not only um, predicting them but preventing them for the future. So with that, I'd like to thank my advisors, Shannon and Guan Ming, and also Karen for being on my faculty and the DMICE faculty, students, staff, and fellows, and everyone who attended my practice talk. Thank you very much, and especially Ted for helpful comments. So I'll take questions now. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more um, about your um, gold standard data as to um, um, I assume that you're running these algorithms against some kind of data of known adverse reactions to these drugs in humans, I assume. I just wonder if you could just say a yeah. little more to that we can under, understand how you're measuring when you're achieving success in predicting. Yeah, so that's, that's a really great point. It's different for a lot of these methods, which is another problem. Um, a lot of these methods are tested by asking if you can recover off targets that we already know exist. And so those are um, recorded side effects and adverse effects for approved drugs. So one of the databases they use is CIDR, which is just a listing of drugs and all the side effects that have been associated with that drug. Does that answer your yeah, question? And, and then so how, and then what, um, what metrics do you use to measure, um, you know, how, how well your predictions are? Um, so usually it's just done with like a area under the curve and whether they come up as associated with that adverse event. So, and usually it's just, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, always interested in, you know, when we apply these predictive methods, how, how we actually measure how well they work because, yeah. you know, for example, with, with any kind of clinical data, there's always some inherent, um, either ambiguity or missing data and things like yeah. that. Yeah, so a lot of these methods focus on um, very well established adverse reactions. And so they're gonna, they'll be at those that have shown up in so many people from the population. The rare ones haven't really been focused on, it seems like, unless the work is specifically for that. Um, but that does bring up another issue is that a lot of times these just focus on class of adverse reactions, and so they don't inherently take into account severity, for instance. Um, so it's not, a lot of them don't actually use uh, reported from specific patients. Dana. Once you're able to add in the context, how do you anticipate this will change um, drug discovery or clinical use? Uh, hopefully in a big way. <laughs> Um, I think that, that's a nice question, thank you. I think that a lot of these models really suffer because they're not, I don't feel like they're actually translational or getting anywhere. They, they have anywhere from 60 to 90 percent in present, um, pre predicting these off targets and these adverse reactions, but then you don't see that carried any further as far as can we actually use this in drug design? As far as I can tell, we aren't really using these models in a rigorous way to try and predict side effects for drugs. And I think actually putting it to use is still missing. So ideally it would be something like that, if you're dreaming big. Yeah. Oh, this isn't a hard one. But 
<clears throat> one of the, first of all, great talk. Really, really good. Um, one of the things that strikes me, you're talking about the structural and docking models. Mm -hmm. And one of the big issues we have is the drug-drug interactions. Yeah, that's a great point. And so, and one of the causes for that is that one drug can change this, the conformation of the target molecule. Do any of these models take that into effect, actually looking at different changes in the conformation? No, none of these models that I've discussed have got into that. They're really starting with the simple case of the binding pocket as it's fully characterized. Um, but that's a really great point and something that is very closely related to this, I think. Yeah, just because it's just there's so much. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Thanks. Did you have a question, Terry? Uh-huh. Yeah. So that one, I think they were mostly focused on polarity. And um, I think they also took into account displacement of water molecules in the binding. No, that wasn't the interaction. Um, I know polarity was taken into account, but they basically just tried to come up with the 3D shape. And one of the things I think they specifically checked for um, is whether there was the presence of like bulky groups that might take up um, space. But I'll have to look into that a little more and let you know. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.